Welcome to this United States Energy Association virtual press briefing. I am Llewellyn King, a journalist who has covered energy for many years. Uh, we are so glad to bring you this exciting subject, this excuse me, interesting subject, vital subject of transmission and how we're going to get the wires we need to move the power we have and the power we will need. We have an extraordinary panel of experts and an equally competent panel of journalists to pursue this issue today. But first, I'd like to have a few words of welcome and greeting from Sheila Hollis, Acting Executive De Director of the USEA, who has made this whole thing possible. Sheila. Thank you so much, Llewellyn, and welcome to our esteemed panelists and the uh, reporters who have seen it in action before. So it's wonderful to have you back with us. Uh, a moment about the United States Energy Association. It's been around uh, nearly a century. Uh, started uh, really when uh, electric energy really became uh, a, a absolute a essential human right, really. Uh, and that's part of our theme in USCA is really energy is a human right in essence. Uh, but the United States Energy Association, we're very busy right now in Eastern Europe, very deeply involved in Ukraine and beyond, but also South America, Central America, throughout Asia, and uh, it has been uh, an ongoing saga since basically the fall of the wall. But in addition, uh, we also uh, have a strength in convening like we're doing here today, whether it's virtual and in person. Uh, and uh, it's been my honor to be uh, involved in USEA for many years as chair of the board and now in this acting executive director capacity. Uh, we're delighted to work with Llewellyn, a longtime friend, uh, delighted to have the outstanding staff that we have. Uh, often uh, uh, you see Kim Grover's photo on there. Kim Grover is uh, really basically uh, my sidekick and friend. And we have a new, uh, a, a new uh, member of our team uh, coming on board, Jonna Hobson, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, communications arena. So with that, Llewellyn, I'd hand it back to you and this wonderful panel and uh, welcome everyone and delighted to have you with us. Thank you, Sheila. I'll begin by introducing the journalists, uh, Ken Silverstein of Forbes, Jennifer Hiller, Hiller of the Wall Street Journal, Matt Chester from Energy Central, Rod Cocro, Freelance, and Rich Herdon, Heidorn, I beg your pardon, of RTO Insider. Our special panel will introduce themselves with just a few remarks about who they are and why they're there. And I'd like to begin with Maria Robinson, Director of Grid Deployment of the Grid Deployment Office at DOE. Thank you so much, Llewellyn. Happy to be here. And, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, my name is Maria Robinson. I am the first director of the Grid Deployment Office, which is one of the many new offices that was developed at the Department of Energy. As we've expanded our role from being a, an R&D only organization to now a major focus on deployment, thanks to the significant investments that Congress has made from both bipartisan infrastructure law as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. We here at the Grid Deployment Office are really focused on um, getting some of our different funding mechanisms out the door in order to help catalyze uh, private investment in transmission moving forward. We have a number of new opportunities, uh, either through financing mechanisms of loans, capacity contracts, grants as well, um, but also new potential authorities, uh, including the ability to purchase a capacity contract through an anchor tenant capability, which I think will help to uh, assist the private market in getting the capital that it needs and providing that additional certainty in order to move forward and uh, hopefully allow for significant expansion of our transmission system, either through um, new mechanisms or, or potentially through advanced reconductoring as well, which uh, we also have some financial incentives for here. So we're, we're very excited to be here today to be part of this conversation and, and to talk about all the different ways that we can continue to work together as an industry with, with government um, to, to face all the barriers that transmission faces today. Uh, Phil Mola. Well, thank you, Llewellyn. It's always a pleasure to speak with you and this panel of reporters. Thank you for having us on. I'm Phil Moeller with the Edison Electric Institute. I think most people realize we're the trade association 
for the investor-owned electric companies in the United States, serving all 50 states in the District of Columbia. We were thrilled to see the clean energy tax legislation passed through the IRA. We are all in on the clean energy transition. However, I think as most of our panelists will agree, expansion of the transmission system is going to be necessary in order to get uh, and reap the benefits of the clean energy transition. Transmission construction is hard. I'm sure Duane will be able to tell you about that or us about that. There are a number of issues that range from setting and permitting to cost allocation and deciding uh, essentially how much these projects should cost. So a big set of challenges, but one is that we have to address if we want this clean energy transition to move forward. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. Dwayne Hiley. Good morning. It's uh, good to join you all this morning. Uh, I'm Dwayne Hiley with Tri-State Generation and Transmission. Tri-State is a poorly named wholesale power supply cooperative that serves 42 utility members in four states, not three. Uh, and we have the privilege to bridge the eastern grid, the eastern and the western grid. So uh, we have members that are in the panhandle of Nebraska, but on the eastern side, and then members in Wyoming and Colorado and New Mexico that are on the western side. So it's, it's very much in our interest as we make a, a rapid energy transition moving towards 80% decarbonization by the end of this decade and 70% clean energy across all four states. We're gonna need a lot more transmission than what we have now to tie all that together and hopefully to move energy across time zones from the east to the west and the west to the east. Thank you and Michael Skelly. Hey, Dwayne, thanks for that tee up. That was perfect. Uh, Michael Skelly, and I'm the CEO, one of the founders of Grid United, and we are an independent transmission development company working on a series of different projects, one of whose themes is exactly what Dwayne pointed out, which is connecting the grids east and west and ERCOT to the west. And these are the types of connections that are uh, especially helpful uh, when we have extreme weather events. Uh, and when we're integrating new forms of energy, uh, be they CCS, which you want to run flat out if you if you do that big back end investment, uh, wind, solar, uh, et cetera. So the more the grid looks like a copper sheet, the better the grid is at uh, receiving new types of generation. And we're focusing on you know, our, our focus is more on projects that others are not focusing on sort of so these east west ties, for example, are not the focus of our traditional planning processes. And it's our hope and belief that if we can advance those projects that uh, um, we will be able to to be helpful in terms of ensuring grid reliability um, going forward. Thank you. And we will go to the questions right now with Rod Cookrow, freelance. Rod. Oh, thank, thank you, Llewellyn. Good morning, everybody. Um, so the, earlier this summer, uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission proposed a, uh, uh, a series of reforms for interconnecting uh, interconnection queues. Uh, right now, it takes more than three years for a project to, uh, to, to get built, sometimes more than that. And so FERC proposed a series of, 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 of things that can be done and the comment period has now closed. And I'm guessing that uh, certainly Phil EEI must have commented. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Tri-State had comments to, to submit. I'm just wondering, did, did FERC get this right? Is this going to be sort of the tool that's going to finally unlock and, and speed up the development of new transmission? That's for anybody on the panel, I suppose. Well, I think we're not quite sure if they've got it right because it's still a proposed rule and we haven't seen the final rule. As you noted, we commented. Generally speaking, I think we feel that the focus on longer term planning is a good move because uh, we've seen examples in the past, particularly in some of the RTOs, MISO and SPP, where they have the more long term planning. These are the resources, these are where they are. This is the infrastructure we need to build out for that. And that's generally good. We also were very supportive uh, in the planning uh, notice of proposed rulemaking. We have a partial reinstatement of letting the incumbent uh, utilities uh, have an opportunity to build these projects. We feel that the former situation where that was removed has actually suppressed transmission construction. So we'll have to see, as you noted, 
The reply comments are in. The commission will consider those and at some point in the future propose a final rule. Thank you. Jennifer, Ron, I, um, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dwayne. Yeah, I, I was going to comment on the question. So the interconnection queue, the clogs in the interconnection queue are symptomatic of not enough transmission. Okay. And I, I, got my start in renewables doing generation projects. And back in the day, you could enter the queue and a year later, you're off to the races because we had capacity on the grid. Now we've used up uh, pretty much all of the capacity in the windy areas. We're doing that again in the solar areas. And so uh, we need to, to really solve this queue issue. We, ha we have to build uh, new, new wires. I was just going to add, as, as we look at the um, expansion of Southwest Power Pole West, which is very likely to happen, um, we've been very interested in how to fix the queue. There's been a lot of criticism of the SPP queue uh, in that it's kind of a free option for developers to put a placeholder in there and then get in the study process. The study process takes Wayne, over a year. Could you explain the SDP queue to, uh, to reporters? So the if you're a developer and you want to interconnect to the transmission system, you have to put in your application by getting in the queue. You say, I want to interconnect. And then studies have to be done to see if the grid can support the project you're proposing, to see if that energy can move across the grid. And if, if people can get in the queue for free, so to speak, a lot of speculation occurs and a huge line forms out the door, so to speak, for this limited transmission grid. It doesn't have enough capacity for everybody. And yet you have to study all these projects and maybe only one of those is ready to roll, really shovel ready. And the others are kind of speculative. So the speculators are in line in front of the person who's got money ready to go. And they're waiting years to get the study done before they can determine if there's capacity. And these other speculators are taking up capacity that they may never use. So the Q reform that has been enacted in Excel and in uh, Tri-State, and we are proposing to enact for SPP, which we see it is going to happen is going to say that if you've got your money and you're ready to move your project, you move to the front of the line. And that, that means that those speculative people who had kind of a free option at looking at uh, getting onto the grid, they don't get to clog up the queue. Thank you. Jennifer Hillow from the Wall Street Journal. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. I'm not sure who to direct this one to. Um, Maybe Michael or, or Phil can have a stab at it. I'm just curious if there has ever been a time where it was easy to build transmission or functional. <laughs> um, it seems like everything just takes um, an incredible amount of time, but I'm wondering, you know, sort of historically how, you know, how things have changed. Um, uh, well, it's small comfort, but, um, and the, the early 21st century would not be the first time in history when we built the grid after we built the generation. So a classic example is the Pacific Intertie, which is a backbone of the Western grid, which runs from uh, the Columbia River, the Oregon and Washington border down to Los Angeles. And that was built after most of the hydro in the Northwest was built. And then after they built all that hydro, they said, oh, geez, how are we going to balance this? And then somebody said, hey, why don't we connect to L.A.? And then during the winter months, Los Angeles can share uh, extra power that they might have and send it to the Northwest, which at the time was a winter peaking system. And in the summertime, but during spring and during spring runoff, when temperatures were hot in Southern California and they had a lot of load growth, they could send the power down there. That was in the, it was first announced by President Kennedy built, I think it was finished in like 1971 or so. Um, but that was kind of an example of planning the grid in the rearview mirror. And so, so we've done this before um, and it's happened elsewhere around the world. China famously built lots of renewables in Western China and then had to build the grid to go with it. So um, the grid often does lag generation, uh, which is not a really good excuse, but it, it has happened and it continues to happen. 
Uh, Jennifer, I'd say there were decades previous, probably the 50s and 60s, and to some extent the 70s and early 80s, where transmission was more easily constructed. There are a number of factors now that make it more complicated, and I think that's one of the reasons we're talking about it, why the FERC is involved, so that we can speed up the process in order to make sure that this needed infrastructure gets built. Thank you, Rich Heidel. Uh, thank you, Llewellyn. Um, Maria, I uh, sat in on your briefing a, a week ago on the uh, National Transmission Planning Study, um, and uh, you mentioned uh, five preliminary findings, none of which uh, seemed terribly surprising, uh, but uh, I know that you've got additional work to do. Uh, I wonder if you could tell us what does the study bring to, uh, to the dialogue? Sure, so the National Transmission Planning Study is one of the two major studies that we're doing here at the department around transmission. That one is our own modeling, looking at the long-term needs of the grid uh, with a variety of scenarios, looking at everything from you know just doing AC upgrades up to full macro grid uh, with full full high, high voltage DC across the country. And so I, I think this is going to help better understand, especially with likely new investments in the generation side, thanks to the tax credits of the Inflation Reduction Act, where we'll need most of the new transmission uh, within the country in order to satisfy the needs of, of consumers, uh, which I think is really important. So it's, it's the first time that we've done this type of massive study on our own. Uh, and that's in addition to our congestion study, which is part of the triennial needs work uh, that happens uh, mandatorily through Congress, uh, which is also helping us better understand what our short-term requirements are going to be. Thank you. Anybody else want to say anything? No? Um, so, Ellen, could I just add one tiny thing just from a lawyerly standpoint? I think sure. a lot of the confusion in this is relates to the structure of the law that underlies it. It's unlike interstate natural gas pipelines that have the Natural Gas Act, which is uh, thou shalt get natural gas moving in interstate commerce facilities certificated, approved by the FERC, as opposed to the transmission system, which did not have that basis. So you have a different structure, despite the fact that they're both interstate uh, facilities uh, moving in interstate commerce. It's, it's, a, it's a little confusing just with respect, particularly the transmission. And that's uh, a whole other, whole other world. Thank you. Thanks, Sheila. Matt Chester. Yeah, thanks. And, and Sheila, that, that comment actually leads well into the question I also wanted to ask Maria, which you know, I, was, I was hoping you could talk more about you know, how the regulatory bodies and, and oversight from the national level at DOE work all the way down with the state and local, you know, how do they interface when it comes to transmission? Because you know, so much of the challenges seems to come from you know, the patchwork of jurisdiction. So, you know, what, what are some of the specific ways that DOA is looking to overcome those hurdles that creates and, and bring these stakeholders together? Sure, and DOE is in a unique position. We're not a permitting agency, unlike our friends over at the Department of Interior or over at the Army Corps. So a lot, a lot of times developers are working with those agencies, but we have the ability uh, to convene those folks together to coordinate across them and as well as provide some of that technical assistance of helping them understand why this transmission is important. Um, and that's the kind of work that we've been doing over the past um, several years now of working directly with our cohorts over at um, over at these sister agencies to help speed up that permitting process a little bit and helping them to understand um, why there is this desperate need for new transmission. Um, at the same time, we're really actively engaging states and tribes in particular, uh, especially those who are being affected by uh, potential transmission build out, um, whether it's looking at um, our Atlantic offshore wind work, which has over 500 stakeholders uh, across the Atlantic coast, uh, trying to help figure out how we're going to um, manage transmission, be it through a backbone or through different radial lines moving forward or some meshing together later on through the process. But uh, we found that engaging those stakeholders earlier and often helps to alleviate some of the local concerns around transmission that tends to um, lead to significant delays through the process. Thank you. And Ken Silverstein from Forbes. 
Well, thank you, Llewellyn, and thank you uh, to our panelists who have joined us. Um, this may be a question for Maria, but it's anybody who has insight into it. Uh, could you please quantify the amount of transmission that needs to get built? If not, if it's not built, what then is the amount of wind and solar that would not make it to market? And then what happens to the decarbonization goals, particularly set under the Inflation Reduction Act? And I guess specifically, what does the DOE say about uh, these issues? Um, no. Go ahead, Maria, go ahead. All right, th thanks, appreciate that. Um, so I'd say first and foremost, you know, we are, we're looking at a significant expansion of the transmission system. A recent report indicates that it's at least 60% growth by 2030 necessary, and we might even need to triple our existing systems by 2050 in order to meet the larger uh, growing clean uh, electricity demands. Uh, and then in addition to the amount of expansion that needs to happen, I think it's important to remember that most of our transformers and our transmission infrastructure is over 25 years old and is likely in need of significant replacement, which is uh, another major challenge to this overall process as well. Uh, can't necessarily comment on how much wind and solar specifically. Obviously, it depends on the, the scenarios, but that is also the kind of thing that we are looking at through our larger national transmission study work. I might uh, just... I, I, yeah. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, I, yeah, I, sorry. sorry. Go ahead. I would refer you to uh, the work of Jesse Jenkins, uh, who's a Princeton... Uh, expert on renewables, grid, et cetera. And by his reckoning, uh, and basically what he did was um, put together a model that assumed transmission got built, and then it, another model that assumed that we continue to build transmission at the current pace. Um, and the result is that uh, if we don't build transmission, uh, then carbon emissions may actually go up uh, because of electrification of transportation and buildings and so on. So, but but if you Google Jesse Jenkins, it's, you can, I think, I can't remember the name of the output, but it's, I think it's REACH or something like that, the name of the uh, think tank that he's affiliated with. Rod Cochran. Uh, thank you, Ellen. Uh, I have a question that may be best answered by either Michael or Duane or, or Phil, because of your companies. Uh, there, there's another FERC proposal that's a little more ripe. It's about probably maybe about to be made a final rule. And that was an April approval of, uh, once again, a series of reforms to interconnection and, uh, and long-term planning for transmission. But in the wake of that, in September, 17 Republican attorneys general uh, filed comments at FERC, which may actually be uh, a foreshadowing of a potential lawsuit once the rule is finalized claiming that FERC lacks no jurisdiction, uh, lacks jurisdiction under the Federal Power Act to do what they've done. Uh, the lone dissenting commissioner was James Danley, who belongs to the Federal Society. And he, he's making this argument that uh, this reaches into the major questions doctrine that is now sort of uh, the buzz before the Supreme Court uh, and that the commission can't do what it's done now. Um, and I, I have two questions, I suppose. One is, when did, when did, transmission planning where there's billions of dollars at stake over 20 or 30 years maybe become a political issue and and is there any chance that these 17 attorneys general could actually succeed in putting a chill on uh, transmission development by trying to force a court case all the way to the supreme court who would like to tackle that Dwayne? you look as well the... let's say uh, when did transmission planning become political? It's always been. <laughs> so it's, you know, if it's not in my backyard, that's definitely a political question, right? Um, you know, just look at tri-states. We have a very sparse area that we serve, lightly populated, larger than the state of California, uh, between New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, yet a million and a half people in all that area and, and lots of transmission to serve it. As we make this rapid energy transition, building gigawatts of wind and solar, an investment of about 
two to three billion dollars in new wind and solar, we're going to add eight hundred million dollars of transmission to make it all work. So that's like one out of every two to three dollars for generation is going to be transmission to support it. And uh, we're going to build it whether FERC gets this other stuff right or not. But it's it's very, very difficult. It's never been easy, but it's harder than ever. And when you talk start talking about uh, the West, where you've got tribal governments, you've got state governments, you've got federal agencies that don't even agree between themselves, between Forest Service and BLM, um, it can become an extreme challenge to get anything built. So uh, we applaud anybody's efforts that are going to try to take some of those barriers down. But it, it's a hard problem, and it's not getting any easier. Yeah, Dwayne, if I could follow up, though, I mean, NIMBY has always been an issue for, for projects of the, of the scale you're, you're talking about, but you operate in some of the red states where attorneys general are, are sort of making this push. Have you ever anticipated or, or thought about the fact that the attorney general of state where you have customers might decide to try to squash uh, your plans to add transmission to bring down the customer costs? Well, I, I think we have pretty good working relationship with our governor's offices and our attorney general offices in, in the states in which we operate. So we, we try to keep them close and uh, we feel like we have good support for what we're trying to do in terms of making the energy transition, in, at least in, our, in our, our part of the world. Okay. I've never thought of you, Dwayne, as being especially diplomatic. That was a very diplomatic. <laughs> That's what I'm all about, Llewellyn. <laughs> uh, Jennifer Hiller. Thanks so much. Um, I was wondering if you guys could talk about re things like reconductoring and if that's, I guess, how helpful that is uh, in terms of, of expanding, you know, our, our transmission capacity, or if it's just kind of nibbling around the edges and not really, not really addressing the, the issue. I would think, Dwayne, you know a lot about uh, I'd say it's, it's essential part of the the solution and in many instances we're we're finding we're not gonna be able to develop the new corridors we want and need so we need these energy super highways but in some cases we're just gonna have to widen the existing road and and that's reconducting that's new poles it's higher you know higher clearances uh wider right of ways that can be a real challenge in some of the uh federal and state lands getting permission for that but it, it's it's all required to make this energy transition we're going to have to have it I agree with Dwayne. I think it's one of the many components that's in there. Um, one of the benefits of reconductoring, of course, is not dealing with the same level of permitting uh, that would be necessary for complete new build. Obviously, it doesn't cover all of the different pathways that are necessary. Um, the other benefit, of course, is that it's it's a slightly faster process. Um, I will say in terms of uh, doing that type of work, we've heard from um, some, some manufacturers that they'd be able to do that work in six to 12 months. Uh, which compared to implementing brand new transmission uh, is, is light years faster. Thank, thank you. We have quite a few uh, inquiries across the transom, uh, quite a few questions, most of them directed to Maria. One says, question for Maria Robinson. In, re in a recent interview, you said, we're really looking and engaging the folks that will be most impacted potentially while also mentioning, quote, a pot of money that could be used for economic development in communities impacted by interstate transmission lines. Uh, <clears throat> they continue, since landowners will have to look at and work around new transmission lines every day are the most impacted. How would economic development in the broader community compensate the most affected landowners? Wouldn't the money be better spent lessening impact on most affected landowners. That comes from Karen Newman. Thank you, Karen, and appreciate the question. I think it's actually a question to some degree for Congress who put forward that uh, particular uh, component within the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, there's uh, an area that provides financial assistance either for economic development, uh, could also provide assistance for uh, local community groups to participate in dockets, um, could also allow for studies to be done along those lines. And, and we're more actively exploring um, what might make the most sense in order to ensure that affected communities are part of that planning process and make sure that their voices are, are in fact heard. Um, certainly statutorily, we can provide that funding to states 
to um, local governments as well, but uh, we cannot necessarily provide it to individuals, which is why I would say that um, just statutorily, we are limited um, from that perspective. Thank you. We've had some similar questions about reconductoring. Uh, I think we'll go on to the next reporter's question of our own panel, uh, which uh, Matt Chester can ask, please. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I wanted to bring the conversation to the, the workforce part of the equation. You know, that $26 billion in investment, it's obviously great news for transmission, but I'm curious how our panelists are seeing the need to have sufficient workers, have them trained in the skills, new technologies, and deployed where they're most needed. You know, how, how is the influx of investment maybe changing the strategy when it comes to hiring and, and the future of the workforce? Uh, man, I might start with that. The, 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 the Electric Subsector Coordinating Council has a working group on, on supply chain now that's taken a look at all the supply chain issues impacting the utility business. And uh, we even had a, a seminar yesterday of Beneficial Electrification League in our office yesterday talking about the same thing. How can we deploy all this federal money that would basically triple the rate of expansion of our energy transition? Uh, and the number one, the number one factor that's limiting us right now is labor availability. Uh, there's just not enough people. And so despite the will we might have and all the money in the world, if we don't have the people, we're not going to get it done. And this is a global problem. It's not even just limited to us. Thank you. Ken Silverstein. Yes, my question deals with uh, central generation in transmission versus on-site generation in transmission. To what extent uh, will the latter on-site generation and microgrids um, be able to mitigate some of the pitfalls that you guys foresee as it relates to transmission um, development? Um, so there's there have been a few studies on this. Um, Americans for a Clean Energy Grid came up with a study maybe six or nine months ago uh, that looked at basically the Eastern interconnect in two scenarios. One with a high uh, degree of distributed generation and the other was sort of more centralized generation. And a little bit surprisingly, the grid that you needed in both cases looked pretty similar. Um, and I think that was because what you saw was in both cases, you'd see at least in the Eastern interconnect, a lot of solar built in the, in the South and Southeast. Um, and whether it's on a rooftop or out in a field, it needed during particularly sunny time periods, it needed to, to move out of that region. Um, and uh, similarly with, uh, with wind, in both cases for nighttime energy, you needed wind from the, the central parts of the Eastern interconnect. So I'd refer you to that study. It's pretty exhaustive if you can sort of fold your way, your way through it. Um, but it does, I think it does speak to the fact that transmission is a kind of no regrets investment. If irrespective of generation choices, uh, if you do lots of nukes, you'll need transmission. If you do carbon capture, you'll need, if you do wind, solar, you'll need it. Um, and even with solar distributed versus central, you still need transmission. Yeah, Ken, to build on what Michael said, microgrids have their place but I, I don't want the focus on them to detract from the need to expand the current transmission system. To me, the, the classic microgrid is Princeton University. They have 80 years of tissue research and they cannot afford to lose power uh, to lose that kind of, uh, of evidence. And so they have invested in a microgrid that will allow them to always have that constant supply, but that's obviously at a cost. So where they make sense, they make sense. But transmission benefits everyone. And that's why, again, I don't want the focus on them to detract from the need for more transmission. Uh, we have a lot of questions waiting, one of which is for Maria, which paraphrased said, do we need to alter NEPA to make transmission extension possible? 
I think the NEPA process is one where obviously there are some major concerns around the amount of time that it takes. I think increased coordination throughout the federal government is something that we continue to explore in order to ensure that uh, we're not repeating ourselves through many processes in order to uh, recreate the wheel hit there. Um, it, it's something that I know is actually a bipartisan issue in looking at how we continue to improve that permitting process while still maintaining a focus on conservation. Uh, so that's certainly a complicated ask. And I know that our friends over at DOI and, and Army Corps are con continuing to investigate and explore. Thank you. Rich Heidel. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Llewellyn. Uh, I have a question for Phil and perhaps uh, Michael might want to uh, uh, respond to Phil after he uh, Here's his answer. Uh, I'm gonna take you back to the, uh, the FERC technical conference early this month on transmission cost controls. There was a lot of testimony about regulatory gaps. Uh, the, the volume of transmission that really is not being uh, checked for prudency either by FERC nor by state regulators. Um, and uh, one of the, uh, the California PUC said 63% of transmission projects in their state are self-approved. Uh, PJM has published data showing that um, since 2014, uh, they have approved 12.8 billion in baseline transmission projects, while supplemental projects have totaled 33.7 billion, about 2.6 times as much. Now, at the end of that uh, uh, conference, uh, Commissioner uh, Christie suggested that uh, transmission owners not subjected to uh, what he called rigorous oversight at the state level shouldn't be eligible for formula rate treatment by FERC, um, uh, the uh, uh, chairman of the uh, main commission suggested that ROE should be reduced. Um, number one, should we, um, the, the fact that this spending is now so dominated, at least in PJM by supplemental projects, which do not get oversight and are really not uh, uh, solving regional problems, um, is this, just an accident or is this really a conscious move by transmission owners uh, in the wake of Order 1000 uh, to try and uh, avoid comp competition and, and have the TOs now overplayed their hand? Rich, thanks for the question. And you pointed out the, the tech conference on uh, cost management, cost containment was a significant one uh, where there are a lot of different voices. Uh, I think one of the things we have going on here, and I think you heard it from a lot of the states, is an opportunity for a lot of education. In other words, the planning process right now is pretty extensive, but what, to what extent are the states involved? To what extent are they aware of it? But these, these processes are usually multi-year processes. Which lines are going to need upgraded or replacement at this time period? And so that process is in place, as well as a number of measures on making sure that there are competitive processes uh, on the EPC contract or, or, or other contractual issues that are necessary to get transmission built. So uh, Order 1000, frankly, did make it more difficult in many cases to have a more comprehensive plan. And so that's something that we're glad the commission is taking a relook at in a number of ways, both uh, particularly with the first notice of proposed rulemaking. It, it's a case where we have an opportunity to better educate state decision makers, uh, perhaps uh, get them um, more informed as the process continues, because it's always my concern that the commission is perhaps wanting to move forward in a set of, of uh, policies that are not perhaps completely informed about the existing processes, which are really quite extensive. Uh, so let, let, me, let me push back a little bit on that. You, you said that uh, Order 1000 made it more difficult to uh, comprehensively plan. How so? Well, in terms of the incentives of Order 1000, uh, going to a, a process that's a more regional process in, in some cases, it can lead to inefficiencies. And uh, I would imagine that some of Dwayne's counterparts have experienced this as well, where there have been proposals that uh, perhaps alleviate some congestion and then proposals are taken in. Those are obviously costly and, and uh, take a lot of time. And then in some cases, the projects aren't even built. 
And, and so part of this is, our, to what extent do we have some urgency to build out the system? And I think almost everyone would argue that Order 1000 can use some reforms, whether it's longer term planning, or switching over to, even though it's related, uh, tangentially, the key reform proposal on interconnection uh, that was mentioned earlier, to make it more efficient so that there's a, frankly, a barrier to entry that uh, separates the real projects from the phantom projects. And as noted earlier, those projects that are ready to be added to the grid should be the first in line so that again, we can move things forward and, and not continue to delay on processes that don't necessarily uh, efficiently add to, to the, the system being expanded. Yeah, I, I'd just uh, add that in the West, it's not too much transmission is not our problem. It's it's not getting it built in the first place. That's the problem. And there's so many projects that are proposed that just as Phil said, we work on them for years and then we just give up and say, that's not ever gonna happen. So we don't even try to push it all the way through the regulatory process. We, we run into too many roadblocks. You might, uh, um, Dwayne, uh, uh, use the British phrase, dada decide, announce, defend, abandon. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, Ken Silverstein. I was um, going to expand the conversation a bit. I can remember doing a story in 2015 or 2016 when uh, Hillary Clinton had proposed during one of the debates about expanding the transmission um, at, you know, there was a lot of discussion about the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, expanding the grid into Canada and into Mexico, and the uh, impact that would have on commerce among uh, the, those three countries, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Who do you wish to answer that, Ken? Who, uh, maybe Maria, if that is included in the DOE study. So our, our study is looking uh, primarily at the continuous United States, um, but at the same time, we also know that there are a number of projects uh, that are looking to connect into can Canada as well as particularly to access some of the hydropower that's there, obviously at different stages of uh, development. So it, it's something that we continue to work to figure out that obviously requires additional permitting, a presidential permit in order to um, go across federal lines there. Um, but it it's certainly becoming a bigger question, especially as we're looking to bring in some of that Canadian hydro into, into our system. Uh, but that those dynamics could potentially change significantly considering the uh, cost impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act too. We have some pretty extensive north-south connections with the provinces. Uh, there's just not a lot of transfer capacity between the provinces east to west. So there's a little bit between Alberta and British Columbia and some of the eastern provinces. As Maria mentioned, there's a, a lot of potential to bring hydropower down from Quebec into the northeast. Those would be uh, new lines generally. But right now, we do have a north-south relationship with them. I think some of the talk in Canada is expanding their ability to go east to west, west to east. We have what several about questions. Oh. Sorry. We have several questions which have come across the transom uh, dealing with the possibility of new ways or new rights of way that can be used for electric lines. Elizabeth Weiss writes, I've heard Wisconsin has had good success building out its transmission network along the highway right of ways because the state already has the right to build there, allowing them to sidestep some of the siting issues. In your experience, could that be a national model? Anybody want to tackle that? How about you, Duane? Well, we, we need a national will to build national transmission east and west. As Phil just said, so much of what we have now is north to south. The RTOs are even tend to be oriented north to south. If you look at Cal ISO, if you look at the SPP, if you look at MISO, and that's why we have duck curve problems. Uh, Luan, I think you teased that out in your announcement for this meeting today. Um, a duck curve exists because the sun sets on a time zone all at once. And if you could move that east and west, you wouldn't have a duck curve at all. 
And, and if we just had the same will to build transmission that we had to build the interstate highway network, we get this done and, and just designate some corridors and get it built. But we fight ourselves and we have so much regulation and uh, it's harder to cross federal land than any other land, frankly. So if, if the federal government says this is a priority and gets behind it and tears barriers down, we could make some things happen and get started building. Uh, what's really needed is the east-west transmission that's going to balance out these renewables so that they have greater value by moving them across time zones. We have an informational uh, email from Jesse Jenkins repeat <laughs> lab it says and it gives the email address uh, for the uh, outfit that uh, that Michael mentioned and the that email address is repeatproject.org forward slash about and I hope that's helpful does that sound right Michael uh your 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 muted Michael Oh, Jesse is uh, is characteristically as responsive as always. So thank you, Jesse. <laughs> uh, it came from somebody else, but uh, I expect that uh, Jesse was behind it. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> let me uh, continue with our own questioners. And how about Rod Fulcrow? Oh, well, thank you, Llewellyn. I'd like to follow up on the question that Matt asked earlier about the uh, labor supply required to sort of do the build out that's envisioned uh, both in the latest legislation and the plans of the various RTOs. And I'd like to ask, to ask you more uh, to talk about if the results of the uh, post pandemic economic consequences such as high inflation, uh, higher interest rates, the shortage of uh, raw materials around the world and ability to get them to where they're needed to, to create the steel needed to, uh, to, to build transmission. Is that going to have any short term or even longer term effect on the ability of the transmission owners to execute their plans? Who would like to tackle that? Well, I, I just mentioned again that the uh, Electric Subsector Coordinating Council, which I co-chair, has this working group on supply chain that's, that's working with DOE right now to identify the most constrained parts of our supply chain and labor keeps coming up as one. Uh, uh, but there's also a number of supply issues on specific equipment that, that we're trying to work through. And, and it's absolutely impacting us. It's, it's a global demand right now. If you, and you, and we, we were having trouble before with supply chain, but if you look at what's happened now, we have poured enormous uh, financial incentive through the Inflation Reduction Act into the United States. So everybody's gonna try to triple the rate at which they're building renewables and transmission to, uh, to allow those renewables to, to work. At the same time, you've got Europe, which is now saying we got to get off Russian gas as quickly as possible because that's a problem. And so one way to get off Russian gas is to build more renewables. So they're going to be pouring fuel on the fire of how fast can we build and how fast can we transition away from the fossil fuels we've been dependent on. So that globally is going to be an issue, not just for this year or next year, but for the next decade. Um, so so can, can I just, yeah, yeah can, I, can I just chime in on that? Go ahead, please. Yes, okay. So if you sort of step way, way back, okay, and you think about how this transition is gonna play out over time, over the next 10, 20 years, okay? What will happen is we now have super cheap wind, we've got super cheap solar, and we put that on steroids with the Inflation Reduction Act. So it's even cheaper, okay? So that will substitute for in many cases for fuel, okay? For either, either coal or natural gas. Um, and it will mean that on people's bills, like the overall bill that we're gonna pay to get electricity to our houses is the electricity piece of that or the fuel piece of that is going to come down, okay? But the transmission piece of it is going to go up, okay? So the overall cost may stay the same, but the pieces, the components of what we pay for electricity uh, are going to, to vary. And that's, uh, now happily there's enough, I'm, you know, look, I'm a transmission developer, so I'm a pretty optimistic guy, but the, the cost uh, increases in transmission, it's still worth it. Um, and 
the way you measure the work, you know, you do these production cost models and figure out like which lines get built and which don't get built. But projects don't get through the system unless they have a very high benefit to cost ratio to begin with. Okay. So that dynamic itself helps to make sure that we only build projects that are in the money, if you will. Thank you. Matt Chester. Thanks. Yeah. And, and I want to stay on the, the topic of the supply chains, you know, in particular critical equipment like transformers, we've heard, you know, months or even longer lead times to get that equipment uh, when it's needed. And, and especially as we have the competition between building the, the new grid infrastructure and while while existing equipment needs to be replaced. So I, I'd love to hear more about, you know, what the strategies are to, to you know, kind of backfill that those critical supplies. And then especially as there's a a rush to kind of fill that in, you know, transformers again specifically. And I know there's there's some concerns out there that you know we're bringing them in from China to fill those gaps. And you know, does that create any sort of grid security issues uh, with with that equipment being attached? Well, I think Duane is the best to answer this because he and his co-chairs on the ESCC uh, do an amazing job following these issues. And it might be worth explaining the ESCC, which includes. Uh, the three major sectors, uh, the cooperatives, public power, and the investor-owned companies, as well as senior members of this administration. They meet quarterly or, or regularly, but we've had a few of these meetings lately, and supply chain is a, a very serious topic where there's been a lot of uh, effort put in. Transformers are a main part, but even labor is a part of solving that problem. So I'll hand it over to Duane, but the ESCC is a great model of government private partnership, dealing with problems, addressing them and coming up with solutions. Yeah, and Phil, that's a great intro. And, and he basically told you what it is, but uh, you know, we were formed following 9-11 to be a public private partnership with the highest levels of government to make sure that we have energy resiliency to plan for an event, to get through an event like a major hurricane or wildfire, and then to recover afterwards. And we've worked a number of issues and, and we're much better today than we were two decades ago oh, and, and, and making real progress. One of the things we're looking at hard right now is the Defense Production Act uh, <laughs> capabilities that DOE has been given uh, that might allow them to engage in helping make transformer supplies better. Thank you. Anybody want to add to that? Okay, we'll go back to Jennifer Hillard. Thanks so much. I wanted to ask about weather and climate and things like hurricanes. Um, you know, we saw transmission lines go down in New Orleans last year, and we've seen, um, you know, some issues with wildfires in the West coming very close. And I'm I'm just wondering what the the sort of weather and climate risk is to the infrastructure we do have and what you know, kind of what's the strategy to, to sort of make that resilient? I'll jump in real quick, uh, Jennifer, you're right. But in the last hurricane, we didn't lose any transmission structures in Florida. So that tells you that the infrastructure investments, the, the hardening, the adaptation, the resilience um, actually pay dividends because uh, we've, we found with studies that if the state of Florida is out uh, it basically costs the economy a billion dollars a day. And so to the extent you can invest in that to prevent those outages, that's a pretty good bargain. Uh, it also points out to the fact that not only is transmission uh, the best optionality, as Michael talked about earlier, as populations change, as congestion occurs, uh, you get other options, as public policies change, as fuel choices change, Transmission is the, the infrastructure that gives us optionality, but it also, if, if invested correctly, it provides that kind of resilience, adaptation, hardening against what we all see as more extreme weather. In, in addition to the reliability benefits of a more robust grid, those are all attributes that aren't really paid for, but they come with the investment and they have to be recognized as such. Uh, and this we have, sorry, go ahead. And, and this is an area where Congress has directed the Department of Energy to invest $10 billion, $10.5 billion in grid resilience and innovation, specifically looking at some of that hardening work that needs to happen, um, both at the transmission and distribution levels, in order to ensure that 
the investments that that Phil mentioned happen um, perhaps at a more rapid pace than was otherwise planned by providing that uh, government matching incentive. We have a, Llewellyn, a question. Uh, Sorry, we, go ahead. We have a wildfire working group that has been engaged. This is another part of the ESCC, been working with the Forest Service and BLM to create master special use permits that will allow us to get in and do the work we need to do for um, fuel management, to eliminate the fuel under transmission lines and right-of-way management um, in a more efficient manner. So we've had in the past to get separate permits for every single forest district, every single company. And what we're on the verge of completing now, and I'm super excited about this, is a master special use permit that's going to allow one, one entity, to, one thing to be negotiated once, and then we can get in and do the work we need to do without so many extra hoops to jump through. Good, thank you. I have a question uh, from a viewer. Uh, it's for Maria. It says, are you familiar, it's from Richard Scrindley. Uh, are you familiar with the DOE solid state substation roadmap that lays out the structured evolution of power electronic transformers for the medium and high voltage? If so, what is being done to fund this research uh, slash applied development effort. So that's some of the work that's happening out of our sister office over at the Office of Electricity on the focused R&D. But I know that for them and for everyone, one of the biggest issues is that transformers and, and also converters actually um, are made to spec. Um, they're not uh, modular in any way, shape or form. And there's a lot of investment going into research to allow for more modular parts, um, recognizing that when you're ordering um, a very specific uh, design, it could take months, years uh, for that to come in. And from a resilience perspective, we wanna make sure that we're able to rebuild more quickly than that, um, recognizing again, the larger impacts of, of weather and disruptive events. Thank you, Rod. Uh, th thank you, Llewellyn. Um I have a question, uh, and it's been met, mentioned several times uh, about the existence of ERCOT. I think, Michael, you're trying to build a, a line into ERCOT. Um, is, is ERCOT you know, a long-term impediment to, to the eventual sort of harmonization of U.S. transmission? Uh, I mean, are there any factors in play here that could lead to Texas maybe designing to become FERC jurisdictional and actually joining the rest of the country and trying to solve this problem, particularly given the fact that they have, I think, the still the largest concentration of wind power in the country, and they may have some resources actually that are available for export. So I guess I'll address that to you, Michael. Uh, yeah, so I would say the chance of, of uh, Texas joining the rest of the country, um, electrically speaking, are between zero and none. Um, and uh, uh, but I do think that the prospect uh, for uh, uh, DC connections between ERCOT and elsewhere are are fairly good. As y'all probably know, there's like around 1,200 megawatts of connections between ERCOT and uh, the outside world, as we in Texas like to call it. Um, and uh, we're proposing a, a project uh, that would connect between West Texas and El Paso. Uh, there's a company called Pattern Energy, which has been working for a while and now has, has sort of really reinvigorated their efforts on a project called Southern Spirit between East Texas and uh, uh, I think it's Mississippi. Um, so I think we'll see more projects like that and they're beneficial because as you point out, uh, ERCOT has tremendous amounts of wind and solar and these lines would allow uh, ERCOT to share that abundance with the rest of the country and also provide reliability to ERCOT during stressful grid conditions. But I know ERCOT, ERCOT has had uh, a kind of a rough go in many respects, but, but one of the reasons that uh, Texas has so much uh, renewable energy, we lead the country in wind and we will soon lead the country in solar is precisely because of its independence and you have one jurisdiction that can make decisions around grid expansion, uh, around fairly low barriers to entry in terms of uh, building projects and so on. So um, I don't think things will change, uh, but I do think in, in terms of like FERC jurisdiction, but I do think there's opportunities and, uh, to, to connect us uh, 
through these DC connections and, and those will be beneficial all around. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Ken Silverstein. Um, just to follow on to Jennifer's question about hardening the grid with hurricanes, what about cyber um, attacks? Who would you like to answer that? Uh, maybe Phil. Um, well, thanks I'm sure Phil would be delighted to answer that. Well, it's we have an extensive government uh, private partnership that deals with this. There are a number of acronyms and agencies. We probably don't talk about it a lot because of the extensive efforts. But once again, with Duane as co-chair of the ESCC, cyber is a major part of what the ESCC does. And uh, it, it manifests itself in several different programs. And I think the interesting thing is in the last, uh, with the legislation and more focus, is expanding those programs to probably more of the smaller uh, energy companies and utilities throughout the country so that we can have a more comprehensive approach uh, toward the cyber threats that are out there. Uh, we're coming towards the end of our time together, so we're going to have as much of a lightning round as we can. Uh, Jennifer. I think Jennifer's left us. Jennifer may have had to go or she may have had transmission problems. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Matt. Sure, I, I like the idea of the, having it be lightning question. So, you know, the, the US grid, it's obviously, it's unique from others across the globe in size, geography, scale, many different things. But that said, are there any readily available, you know, lessons that we should be taking from any international grids that have yet to make their way to, to the US? Uh, look at uh, the cap and floor system that they use to connect the UK to continental Europe um, and look at competitive auctions in Brazil. Okay, um, Rod Kukro. Um, I, I'm wondering if any of you have a high degree of confidence that there is one major transmission project that is so far along that's, and it's going to sort of set the tone for uh, other development. Uh, if you had to name a project that you think sort of come online next year, two, three years, and sort of be a demonstration of what you all are trying to shoot for, um, what would that project be? Well, I might mention Gateway West, the one that uh, has been probably 12 to 14 years in development in the West, but it seems to be moving forward. But it's also a good lesson in the challenges and the difficulty of building long lines. Thank you. Uh, Rich. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm curious uh, whether um, any of you have uh, uh, some takeaways from what's been going on in Ukraine, uh, where they've lost uh, about 30% of their infrastructure due to Russian attacks. Um, what does this tell you about uh, what we should be doing perhaps in, in the US? Yeah, defense in depth. Redundancy, it's what's always saved us no matter what happens, whether it's weather, cyber attack, or physical kinetic attack. Thank you, Ken Silverstein. Rich just took my question. He's a brilliant guy, he asked a brilliant <laughs> question. I'm gonna pass. Um, I had, um, had the exact same question, the exact same thought. Uh, well, Ellen, could I interject that we are doing massive amounts of work, USEA, in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe right now. There's a huge, huge effort to uh, help the people of Ukraine uh, with respect to basically surviving a very tough winter. And uh, certainly uh, the U.S. government, USEA, uh, are, are very deeply involved in seeing what can be done both physically and the uh, interconnection, the uh, availability uh, of, of equipment and that. So there's a lot, there's a huge amount of effort going into that uh, for, backed by the US government. Thank you, Sheila. Um, Maria, would you like to say a few words in conclusion? Get the last word on us as it were? I think it's an exciting time to be in transmission work. So it, Everyone's starting to focus on it. It's been on the back burner for a while. Now it's coming up to the front. So it's a great time to get involved. Thank you very much. And thank you all very much.
I appreciate our panelists on both panels for taking the time. Uh, Phil, do you want to say something? I was just waving goodbye, Llewellyn. Well, goodbye it is. But meanwhile, I'd like to thank Sheila, who you just heard from, for making this possible and for the enormous amount of help I get from Dominic Levings and I'm now getting from a new member of the staff, Jana Hobson. I thank you all for taking the time for the critical subject and we look forward to seeing you on future programs in this series of virtual press briefings from the United States Energy Association. Goodbye all, cheers. Bye, thank you.